Good afternoon and welcome to the Scripps Technical Forum. I am Douglas Alden and I'm the lead engineer with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes here at Scripps. In addition, I function as the STF chair and get assistance setting up and running STF from my colleagues here on campus, Gwen Nero and Vanessa Scott. Gwen is the director of corporate affiliates, business development, industry outreach and innovation. And Vanessa is an industry relations and innovation analyst. If you missed any of our recent presentations, you can find them on the Scripps Technical Forum playlist on the Scripps Oceanography YouTube channel. Please know that today's presentation is being recorded. You've all been muted when you logged into the conference. If you have a question for the presenters, please use the uh, Q&A function. Um, I also uh, would just say that uh, you might want to put your, your uh, view into presenter view. Um, so you see the speaker or speaker Greg Johnson um, as the only speaker on the screen, just because he's going to be using a whiteboard and it might be difficult for you to see uh, that in, in grid view. And if you're not familiar with that feature, I think it's up in the upper right hand corner of Zoom. So today we will have a presentation by Greg Johnson, president of RBR. Greg will provide an update on engineering and product developments at RBR with a focus on RBR's approach to solving challenges in ocean measurement and data acquisition. Great. Thank you, folks, uh, Vanessa and Douglas, for organizing this, and Drew standing by uh, for tech support. Hope we're not going to need too much of it. Um, what I am going to say uh, is I uh, appreciated seeing the list of people who were signed up, and I can see that there are about uh, seven or eight people. Um, but of course, I can't see who you are, so it's not the classic Zoom, it's more of the webinar. Um, and I'm actually not planning on doing slides, I'm planning on really just chatting, which means if it's possible for people to be uh, to unmute themselves when they want to ask a question, that is just fine. I would rather have a kind of interruption. Um, I'll deal with anything that comes up in the chat, of course, uh, but uh, I'm also quite happy just to be interrupted and talk about things as we go. Um, the, the headline is uh, um, more magnificent than the talk is going to be. Um, and really, I wanted to uh, just give people who haven't uh, seen RBR folks in a little while uh, a bit of an update as to what's happening here. Um, maybe I'll start by quickly showing you uh, that we get up to, that we have real people in a real building. Um, so I'm uh, just coming out of one of our meeting rooms here. And uh, this one is actually uh, something that should be near and dear to your heart. This is the name of this meeting room. Huh. And uh, next door, we have Trieste. Uh, we have Picnic Line uh, around here. Oh, there we go. This is the uh, Calda uh, kind of collaboration area. And uh, this is R&D, which is, uh, it's a Wednesday, so we have kind of work from wherever Wednesdays. And uh, we have some friendly engineers who wave, and we have some engineers who are trying to focus. So we've got a couple of those. Um, and so there are about uh, 25 uh, engineers here at uh, RBR um, across the disciplines, really, mechanical, electronic, uh, sensor development, scientists, um, uh, firmware, software. Um, down below here, uh, we're looking down on the uh, uh, production floor. So some of our production staff, it's uh, just after four o'clock in the afternoon here in Ottawa, and they're starting to pack up for the day. Um, and right below my feet is the uh, calibration lab, uh, which if anybody has an interest at the end, I'll take you down and, and show you that as well. So um, we've been working on lots of things uh, during COVID and uh, many of you will know us for our CTDs. Um, temperature, pressure, uh, wave recorders, that kind of thing. But we've been moving more into optical sensor development in the last couple of years, starting with an opdode that we developed mm, probably about four years ago, maybe even five years ago. The gray hairs belie uh, my memory. Um, and uh, more recently, I've done some work to develop uh, both power and uh, radiometry sensors. So um, both of them are fairly, I would say, seemingly straightforward measurements. Uh, PAR is your, I'm sure, all aware, again, without seeing the names and uh, um, thinking back to who I know and who I don't know. I think Brock, did I see you? Yes, I see Brock, Nick. 
Oh, San twice, San three times. I think he, he or she has shared his invitation. Um, so, um, you know, PAR is uh, photosynthetically active radiation or available radiation being light that is available for photosynthesis. So uh, to the human, that's quite easy to describe as visible light, uh, light between 400 and 700 nanometers. And uh, so uh, measuring that underwater is, of course, important if you want to look at primary productivity um, and um, uh, algae and, and other kind of photosynthetic behavior. Um, and there are two classic uh, geometries uh, for doing this. One is a, a cosine response, which is to say, if you have an optical sensor with an orientation that's nominally up towards the, the sun, um, uh, a cosine response has its mag maximum at the zero and, uh, and then its minimum over at minus 90 and plus 90 degrees. That is to say, it looks like a raised cosine curve where instead of being centered around the uh, y-axis, it's been raised up. So there's a zero on either side and the uh, one actually becomes plus two in the middle. Uh, that cosine response is a little tricky to achieve. Um, and uh, it's typically done by having a a light diffuser that gathers the light uh, from anything that's in the upper uh, hemisphere, um, but uh, needs to have some kind of ability to uh, roll off the cosine response at the edges, typically done with guard ring. And then uh, you want to have the sensitivity rolling off like a cosine uh, towards those edges, which is uh, most easily done by taking a cylindrical diffuser and making it slightly proud of the optical surface. So um, I may or may not be able to show you. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Yeah, so I can do this one. And if I share, da -da -da -da. there, I think you can see a graph that is our cosine response uh, measured in water. So um, this is compared to an ideal cosine. So this is actually cosine error. And you can see that we're within 10% um, of 10% uh, error of an ideal cosine up to about 80, 80 degrees or so. So we're quite happy with that. Zero being the uh, on axis um, thing. Um, now I am going to show you, oops, see. Quick, quick question, Greg. I just uh, if I don't, if you don't mind me asking, what what do you use as the material for your diffuser? Um, so uh, typically, people use uh, acrylics, and in fact, so I have um, an instrument in front of me here, and it's got its protective cap on the end. And I'll show you how it's constructed. So um, let's see if you can see things, and if I if my jiffers give me away, it'll be shaking. You can see that we have an instrument where the active part is actually just up here. The rest of it is really just uh, readout electronics and not that important. Um, so this is the uh, PAR sensor. It actually looks identical to our narrowband radiometers, but I'll talk about them in a second. And so the active element is a photodiode sitting underneath this white spot, and the white spot is made of acrylic. Uh, however, the acrylic is uh, not actually pressure bearing um, because we make the instruments rated to 2000 meters. And one of the reasons that some people's power sensors only go down to 500 meters or so, uh, well, there are two reasons. One is uh, that it's very difficult to make acrylic or um, white plastics in general uh, with good diffusing characteristics go deeper and still be pressure tolerant. Uh, the second is that they work on the basis that there's no light any further down. And so why would you be interested in measuring it? The reason, uh, and it's a good point, the reason we go to 2000 meters is that it's interesting to put these on profiling vehicles like Argo floats that are going down to 2000 meters and coming back to the surface, even if the interesting data is only actually up at the surface. So uh, that's, uh, so we're using an acrylic diffuser. Underneath, however, we have a pressure window um, and you can see that the diffuser is very slightly proud of that black surface. So this top surface is actually titanium, um, uh, but we've uh, painted it black to reduce any spurious reflections. And you can see if I hold this exactly side on to the camera that the uh, diffuser is just in line with 
the guard ring. So that zero response is, is uh, by design at uh, plus minus 90 degrees. Um, the other thing that's important, let me see if I can pull up the second graph. The other thing that's important is how actively you can uh, cut off the response outside of four to 700 nanometers. Um, now water itself, let's do the share again. There we go. Uh, water itself will do a reasonably good job of cutting off ultraviolet. Um, most people are familiar with the idea that uh, while you might get a bad sunburn if you're wet, you typically don't get a bad sunburn if you're fully underwater, although you, you can get some. Uh, so UV doesn't go terrifically far in water. Um, but we have a, uh, a bandpass filter underneath that is cutting off both the UV end uh, below 400 and also the infrared end uh, above 700. And the thing that acts in our favor is that photodiodes in general aren't very sensitive to UV in the first place. So most photodiodes are very uh, happily sensitive to visible light and infrared. And so it's the filtering at the infrared end that you really need to pay attention to. So the, the blue uh, boxcar filter here is the ideal response for a, for a power uh, spectrum. And uh, we're quite happy with that, uh, uh, with the response that we've measured here um, over the visible light spectra. Um, and move on to the narrow band radiometers. And these are really where you're interested not only in quantifying the quantity of light in total, uh, but also trying to ascribe some color to it. And clearly, uh, if you were to take a radiometer that had one nanometer bins all the way from 400 to 700, you would have a, a complete spectrum and uh, almost a spectrophotometer really that would uh, um, tell you about the intensity of light at each wavelength. Uh, that's called a hyperspectral radiometer. Um, Multispectral radiometers are those which are, have a, a few selected uh, wavelengths or bands. And uh, we make narrowband radiometers that can be used together in a uh, multispectral sense. The bandpass for each of them is typically uh, 10 nanometers. So you could take something out of the red, something out of the green, something out of the blue. Not, not many people do that again, because uh, in water, most of the reds disappear. Um, but um, you can certainly tailor the frequencies that you're looking at. Uh, and we have about six different filters that we offer, including 532, which is the green laser line, uh, which is quite an interesting one to look at because it's useful in assessing um, not only how much light is coming down for photosynthesis and things like that, but also as a standardized measure of uh, um, transmissometry. And so trying to assess background levels of that uh, can be helpful. So uh, those are, that's really a brief introduction to the, the PAR and radiometer. They're both available in a sensor package that we call the CODA. Um, and the, the CODA comes in a couple of different form factors. Uh, this one is a completely self-contained instrument that you apply a nominal 12 volts to the MCBH on the back end, and you immediately start getting serial data just streamed out. You can also ask for it to come out only when you pull the instrument. Uh, but by default out of the factory, it will start just spitting out engineering calibrated data um, to uh, at a rate of two hertz. Um, if you wish, you can stop that and tell it only to sample on demand. Uh, we also have a much shorter version that we use when it's integrated with our CTD, and we don't need all the digital electronics uh, in here. Any questions on either of those two? Um, I don't know how many people on the call are more interested in hearing about optics and how many people are more interested in hearing about kind of data boy controllers and systems ends of things. So I'm going to pause for five seconds until there's an embarrassing amount of silence. Oh, there are some chats. Hey, I can't... hey uh, Greg, this is Mike. Uh, hey, Mike. Hey, uh, good to see you. Um, does the uh, power supply on that, is that isolated from the case or you have any kind of... Uh, electrical specs from case to electrical and signal uh, yep. parameters. Yeah, so we, we do not ever put anything in contact with our case. Uh, so there is no danger of ground loops or anything like that. Um, it is a titanium housing uh, completely, uh, with the exception of the acrylic, and it's a titanium MCBH and the neoprene off the back of that. Um, and there are only, Certain instruments we make 
where a decoupling capacitor is used uh, just to make sure that the uh, uh, noise um, uh, is kept to a minimum. Uh, but we don't have any ground loop uh, things. And I'm, I'm kind of guessing that's what you're alluding yeah, to. That's, that's basically it. I mean, we, we are, we're fighting that ourselves with a bunch of our stings and things. And if we added that to the cluster, then it's neutral, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't, uh, for instance, we, we sometimes put these in waters with um, uh, pH sensors and pH sensors are extraordinary at uh, picking up ground currents um, uh, by their very nature. So if you want a very effective ground current detector, um, a glass electrode pH sensor is, is quite a good one and it spots all your engineering errors immediately. Um, and so, yeah, you shouldn't see any, any issues there with that. Anybody else? I can see a few introductions in here. Okay. Oh, ah, Jerry was on flip. Yes, indeed. Okay, good. Um, so I, I'm then going to move on to the RBR Cervelo. And the RBR Cervelo is a product that I don't actually have here in house because our shipment back from Ocean Business has been lost by Air Canada. Um, and uh, so as a result, I'm going to draw on the wall as to what it is. And now I can actually see. So I, with the screen brightness, I am not we're going to see whether the reflections make it impossible to see anything. Mm -hmm. the question is, does that make it better or worse? So I think it makes it a little better. There we go. If it gets too dark, I can't see and I'll fall asleep on the presentation. You might want so, to turn off your, your screen share. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. That's the limit to how many times you can look at that graph. Okay, is that any better? I think so. Okay. Looks great, gonna... Greg. Okay, thanks. So what's the RBR Cervelo? Uh, the RBR Cervelo, you'll have to excuse my artwork, is a uh, data boy controller that was originally designed, uh, intended for use with the Scripps Wirewalker. And so the Scripps Wirewalker, which is now commercialized by DMO, is uh, consists most of the time of a 70 centimeter very wobbly float that's only, I don't know, it's about a meter tall and 70 centimeters in diameter. Uh, and the, uh, this sits on the surface of the water and it wobbles as easily as possible with the waves. And that uh, wobbling wave energy is coupled down a taut mooring line that is held by a weight. Um, to a ratcheting cam system that's sitting in the middle and it converts much as a mechanical rectifier or a diode, it converts that wobble that's in both directions into unidirectional mechanical motion uh, of this profiler. And the profiler is usually about, I don't know, a meter and a half, uh, five feet in height. Uh, and this goes down the mooring line until it hits some kind of stop. Uh, that stop releases the ratcheting mechanisms inside. The thing ascends under its own buoyancy uh, back up to the surface until it hits a stop up there. Uh, where it's kind of a rinse, lather, repeat, or lather, rinse, repeat process. Um, and in fact, you can't stop the thing going. Even in the smaller sea states, uh, it's quite happy to work its way down. And what's interesting is that the ascendant motion is always decoupled from the motion or from the sea state because it's under buoyancy completely and the line is just passing through harmlessly. So we made a Cervelo, which is to say um, a brain, a data controller, that would sit in the buoy at the top. Uh, so it's about 25 centimeters, uh, 10 inches or so in diameter. And its purpose is to collect the data from the instruments that are on the wire water. And so if you take our CD, well, I'm going to draw a bigger version. So on the wire walker, if you take our CD and mount it with the interesting end up, then uh, you are going to get the best flow characteristics when the profiler is mo moving up through the water column. Um, you'd like to do that for as long as possible, and you're going to do it continuously at maybe 16 hertz. So we're going to put a big battery pack in there. Uh, that's called the RBR Fermata. And for those of you who remember your days of piano as a child, the Fermata symbol is this one, which is, uh, it, it means in musical notation to prolong beyond the usual duration. Uh, so it seems like a good name for a battery pack. Uh, the formatter uh, drives the CTD, but the CTD, as well as storing the data internally, needs to get the data up to the surface 
And so on the mooring line, we have a ferrite coupler and an inductive modem. And our inductive modem uh, runs at uh, 4800 baud. And it's uh, completely RBR agnostic. It's like a telephone that doesn't care what language you speak. The telephone only has a standardized protocol for how to connect to somebody. But once you're connected, you've dialed the phone number, uh, you can speak English, Chinese, Spanish, uh, even American, if you like. And uh, most phones will tolerate it. Uh, the 4800 board is a true throughput uh, from the device to the top end. And what comes out at the top end is simply what the modem converts back to uh, the, uh, the Spanish that you were speaking originally. What this means on the wire walker is that even though the instrument is moving up and down, we can inductively couple onto this mooring line, which is typically grounded at the bottom. It's jacketed all the way up, and then it's grounded again at the top. And that means we've now got a current loop uh, for the inductive modem to work over. And with the additional of either a ferrite coupler at the top or a direct connect transformer, the Cervello can see the data that's being streamed out of here. It's, uh, it's quite interesting because it's robust to um, any damage that might happen to the mooring line itself. So if the mooring line gets damaged either by the ratchet or by uh, fish bites or other kind of abrasion, then when the wire walker goes below it, all of a sudden communication is cut off because the apparent ground has been lifted up to this point. But the Cervello is actually quite smart. It's not just listening to the instrument, it's in, uh, interrogating the instrument. And so when it can't speak to the instrument, it patiently keeps on trying over and over again until the wire walker returns up above this fish break location. And then it says, oh, okay, I've got a bunch of data for you that you haven't seen before, and it plays catch up. And because the modem is so fast, uh, relatively speaking, uh, then it's very straightforward for, for that to happen. Now, one of the things in a wire walker application that we don't want to do is bother making measurements when the wire walker is going down if we mounted all the sensors facing up. Um, that's because the flow of water over the wrong side of the wire walker really provides big thermal contamination. And it's also kind of ratcheting down and it's a bit noisy mechanically and there's some entrainment. So we put the sensors with the good stuff facing upwards, but then we've got the problem that we're wasting half of the power of the instrument package measuring when we're going in the wrong direction. So all of our instruments have something that we now call oops, DD sampling. And uh, this is a very simple acronym for direction dependent sampling. Direction dependent sampling is exactly what it sounds like. The instrument detects which way it's traveling. Is it ascending or descending? And it's configured with two different sampling rates, one for the ascent and one for the descent. So you simply say to it, I'd like you to run at 16 hertz during ascent and only once every five seconds during the descent. Uh, that means that the instrument will automatically go to sleep for four and a half or so of those five seconds. And you get tremendous, uh, not only battery, uh, but also power consumption. Um, uh, sorry, not only power, but also memory consumption benefits. So what happens in the Cervello? The Cervello is really a generalized data controller, and it's a product that started off as a project. So inside the Cervello at the top, we have a transport to the instrument. And so in the case that I've just told you about, the transport is our mooring line modem. And the mooring line modem or inductive modem is the way in which the Cervello can communicate down to the instruments. Now on the Cervello that uh, we've done for uh, scripts, uh, Rob and uh, Drew and Mike and Tyler and uh, Jonathan and all these guys, um, uh, the connection is to a single instrument that's down below and it happens to be moving. We store the data internally and you can come along and get out that data directly by actually walking up to the boy. And so that is simply a USB connection. Actually, it's a USB stick. And the USB stick, you plug it into the side of the Cervello. The Cervello lights up red, indicating don't touch it. And after a few seconds, it lights up green again, which means it's safe to pull the USB stick out. You can pull it out and you've now got all your data on it. 
That's actually a bi-directional process. So if you want to change the sampling rate or any kind of behavior that the instrument or the Cervelo has, you can put a little program, a little configuration file onto the USB stick, put it in, and the Wirewalker will treat it, the, the Cervelo will treat it as a new set of uh, configuration and, uh, and apply them immediately. However, it's much more interesting if you think about real-time data. So what are our options for getting real-time data out the top? Uh, the USB stick is, I'm, I'm gonna call it soft, well, not even soft real-time, just not very real-time at all. Um, but we do have a GSM modem in there, um, and we also have an Iridium modem. And the Iridium and GSM modems are actually both running uh, in parallel and smartly used. And by smart, what we mean is if you put a SIM card in both of them, then we'll check GSM first because it's cheapest and it's fastest. And so if there's a GSM card, then we will telemeter all the data out in real time to a data hosting service, which is actually also known as Amazon Web Services. Um, so that uh, will happen. But sometimes, let's say in your Wirewalker deployment, where you might have noticed I didn't draw an anchor on it. I drew only the weight to keep the line taut. Many Wirewalker deployments are not tethered at all. And you might drift offshore. Once you drift offshore and you're outside about uh, 14 miles from a, a GS, um, uh, from a GSM base station, then you need to flip to Iridium. And so the Cervelo automatically flips over to Iridium and we now then do satellite transmission. Satellite transmission is a bit slower. Um, so we have to do a lot of compression on the data to be able to go, get it all out. Uh, but it also ends up in the same data hosting service. And it doesn't actually matter to the uh, data service where the data is coming from. It just seamlessly merges those two. That's the Cervelo as originally conceived um, for, for Drew and the team. However, we've since taken that and extended it in a number of uh, interesting ways. Um, so the first idea is that maybe we don't have to have the Cervelo above water in a kind of nominal IP68 case. It could be in a pressure housing instead. So let's make the whole thing go underwater and live underwater for an extended period of time. Um, I'm going to draw a different picture actually that shows what that kind of deployment might be. And we've done a number of these. Let's start off with one that we did. I don't think the green is very visible. Better. Um, and so this is one where we take our Thermata battery pack. Uh, which has a large amount of power, about one kilowatt hour in outline or three kilowatt hour in lithium cells. And we take the Cervelo and we do some ungodly alliance between the two. And what we produce is a single instrument that is not only the brain, but also the brawn, the power. Uh, brain plus brawn. And we very uncreatively called it the Savata, which is the hybrid between the two. And so the Savata sits in a titanium case, which can go down to uh, about 4,000 meters. And instead of having an inductive modem link to a connected instrument, it actually has serial links. It's got a pair of them. So RS485 or 232 to a couple of instruments. And you start to wonder, well, what's the point of a Savata without any of the real-time telemetry? And the reason is that we might have uh, seismic instruments uh, like an APT or a BPR or an OBS, BPR, that are sitting on the seafloor and they were quite expensive to deploy correctly on the seafloor. We want to run them without cables observatory and we want to get all the data off and we want enough power to run them for a couple of years. But every couple of years, we want to come and get the data. Now, uh, those of you who've been around since, uh, you know, um, Gopher and Archie and the kind of beginnings of uh, Unix things and the internet, um, remember a lot of discussion about SneakerNet. SneakerNet is still, I think, the fastest way to get 
multiple large amounts of data uh, from one location to another. There is no other networking protocol that's as fast as SneakerNet. And SneakerNet consists of picking up a hard drive and just carrying it on your sneakers. So the idea for this underwater deployment is that the ROV that comes down to change out this battery pack once every two years performs a sneaker net download. It doesn't sit down here for five hours with an underwater connection from the ROV to the Savata, uh, wasting all your ship time and your ROV time to download it. It simply brings a second Savata. Then it unplugs this one and it plugs in the second one and takes this one away. So the Savata is tolerant of interruptions, just like the wire walker was. It's tolerant of interruptions to these instruments. And these can be buried in the seafloor for decades when the Savata is just changed out every couple of years. So that was kind of a second variant of the Savello uh, that got built. The next variant of the Savello after that, and you can see that with each iteration, we're making things slightly more flexible. So just, we started off with an, inductive link to one instrument. And then we have serial links to two instruments. Well, what we've done uh, more recently is back again on the surface, but this time it's on ice rather than water. And uh, this is a project for NIWA in New Zealand and uh, um, New York University who are both actually having a deployment done in the Austral summer in uh, about two months time by COPRI, the Can uh, Korean Polar Research Institute. And this is a Cervello that has inductive times mm, about 20. And so this inductive, this is now a box sitting on the top of an ice shelf. And the ice shelf is about 500 meters thick beneath which is the Southern Ocean of Antarctic Sea. And uh, so Kopri will be ice drilling through the shelf and dropping down here a inductive mooring line. And it will go down about a thousand meters. And normally an inductive mooring line requires a seawater return. And you can't guarantee the seawater return through the ice shelf because the ice is gonna freeze up. So we simply bring the cable back and so we have a pure wire loop, but it's still just galvanized three by 19 wire rope. It's pretty cheap compared to an electrical cable. And the Cervello is talking to the top of this, uh, and these are all the instruments. On the other side of the Cervello, yeah, we do have GSM, although there isn't much coverage down there, um, but there it is Iridium. And so all the data is coming out in real time. So what's on the data stream? Well, we have lots, of CTDs. I think there's about 15 of them on a per chain. And so up to this point, it's been RBRs talking to RBRs. We have this modem that's agnostic, but actually it's speaking RBR-ish on both ends. Um, so on this project, we did something a little different. We added support for Nortex. And so we've got Nortex in between. And we're using their, um, now it's not a signature series. I think it's the, uh, um, the latest Aquadop uh, profilers. And so what happens here is that all of these instruments are running autonomously, collecting data internally, and the Cervello is able to round robin through each of them and say, um, what have you got for me that I haven't heard recently? And the Cervello does all the housekeeping to keep track of, oh, I, I already heard everything since 12 noon, um, just tell me the last hour of data. All of that data is again stored internally, just on like any other Cervello, but it's also telemetered off in real time. And because this is something that's going to be covered in snow, after short order, uh, then the iridium actually is mounted on a, a kind of four meter mast and sticking up here. So that's the, the next uh, Cervello uh, iteration that's been done. And the final one that is being worked on right now really takes the notion of a Cervello as an intermittent data boy controller to another um, a use case where intermittent is intended. And you'll have to forgive my art. 
we have a boat on the water. And the boat on the water, well, we'll have two boats on the water going in opposite directions. And uh, this is going to be the RV something or other, and this is the FB something or other. So one's a research vessel and the other is a fishing vessel, but they're exactly the same as far as the Cervelo is concerned. The Cervelo can be mounted on the deck at the rear, and it still has GSM and Iridium comms to upload the data, but its connection to the instrument is not hardwired at all. It's Wi-Fi. So it only talks to instruments which it's able to see over Wi-Fi, which means instruments that are in air. So on the research vessel, this is ideal for a winch CTD. And whenever that CTD comes back out, the Cervelo downloads the data from it. The instrument doesn't need to come out of the water very far, really only the end cap needs to be at the surface. And it can be about uh, 30, 40 meters off the stern of the research vessel. And the data from that uh, wireless instrument is captured by the Cervelo, along with any others that might come in or might be on the line. And we get the same kind of telemetry. And it can really be a hands-off operation. So the Cervelo and the CTD just do this automatically. The CTD will turn off when it's out of the water automatically. It will turn on the Wi-Fi when it knows it's about to leave the water. All that kind of power management is built into the RBR things. And the fishing vessel one is kind of commensurate. Only this one is where people have put the instruments and attached them to nets. Uh, it might be for a variety of reasons. It might be a citizen science project where you're taking, taking advantage of the fishers going to regular locations and trying to get uh, uh, CTD profiles in, in the same area every time, much like a ferry box um, kind of idea. Um, or it, it might be uh, something that's actually for the benefit of the fishers directly to help them understand the relationship uh, between what they're catching and what's happening here. And these instruments, uh, these ones are almost always titanium. Um, even if they go into shallow conditions, we build them uh, rugged. Uh, these ones automatically get communicated with their Cervelo whenever the net comes back on deck. So that is a, a uh, very interesting kind of evolution of a product that we did starting as a project. Um, and it's something that has just kind of iterated over time, uh, driven by people asking for things that they would uh, like to see in one way or another. And so that is really a very brief um, overview of what the Cervelo does. I didn't tell you too much about the data hosting and how all that's presented um, or the ins and outs of the various things, but I think I'm gonna call it there and see if uh, anybody has any questions for this very brief RBR technical talk and scripts. There you go. And you just pull yourself off mute and start uh, pestering me if you've got something to say. I can see half of Mike Golden lurking in the background. Nice photo. I've got a question for you and that's, uh, um, what do you do about fouling on your op optical sensor? So uh, the sensors which are up in the uh, photic zone where they get fouling, we typically wipe them and use a kind of toothbrush-like arrangement, uh, wipers from Zebratech or a number of other uh, manufacturers. Uh, optics on uh, floats and other things tend to benefit from uh, really the massive increase in um, satellite telemetry bandwidth through the Iridium uh, constellation. And they don't develop fouling in the same way that they used to with Argos telemetry because they're only at the surface for a few minutes. And so really like the Argo program, for instance, confusingly Argo and Argos are not the same, uh, but the Argo program is doing a 10 day profile. Uh, nine and a half days are sitting down at a thousand meters. So no fouling is occurring at least, no fouling of, uh, of quantities which are uh, concerning. Um, and then when they're at the surface, they're really up telemeter and back down again. Uh, 15 years ago, when it was Argos, uh, then it was a big problem because you're sitting at the surface for 24, 36, 48 hours, and you really do get a lot of clutter uh, building up. We have a kind of religious philosophy that we don't put poison in the water uh, full stop, uh, no matter what it is and no matter how much it is. And so um, the developments for CTDs, for instance, for anti-fouling in moored applications really uh, force us into uh, active anti-fouling measures like ultraviolet 
But of course, we're riding the coattails of ultraviolet LED commercial UV LED uh, developments. And uh, anybody who's followed LED developments is aware of solid state physics. Uh, we started off with the reds, then we went to oranges, and then green was a breakthrough, and blue LEDs were amazing, and UV LEDs are out of this world. But commensurately with the uh, shortness of the wavelength uh, or higher energy is much increased price and also much more significantly abysmal efficiency. So UV LEDs are about 0.01% efficient today. Uh, so every watt you put in produces a tiny number of photons. And so they're really only practical uh, and it doesn't matter whose UV LEDs you use, they're all fundamentally at that level. Um, they're only really practical if you've got some external source of energy that's more than just a couple of batteries. Uh, so if you've got solar available and you can cable to your solar source and you're not that deep, uh, then that's great. Um, but a pure battery powered deployment, uh, you really need something. I mean, there's been some very nice work, for instance, on the wire walker, uh, investigating how to generate power by stopping that motion that I talked about earlier as being uh, unstoppable. Well, if you could stop it, you could take that potential energy and turn it into a small, you know, maybe it's only a matter of watts, but watts to us is a ginormous amount of power. We're, you know, when we're sleeping, we're consuming 10 microamps or uh, 100 microwatts. Uh, and when we're active, we're only consuming, mm, I don't know, uh, six milliamps or so. What's that, 72 milliwatts? So um, yeah, you can do an awful lot with a small power source, but underwater power sources of semi-infinite duration are hard to come by. Thanks, Rick. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, hey. Yeah, that's very, I, I really like some of your new gadgets that you've uh, integrated and in, especially your, your um, introduction of this uh, sort of agnostic uh, interwoven uh, uh, inductive chain. And uh, so what does one need to get started if we wanted to experiment with the agnostic part of it and, and put our own gadgets on there? What what do we need to get started there? And say our lab wanted to, to put on some um, sensors we're, we're developing and, and we just want to talk to our own gadget at the surface. What What do we need? So inside every Cervelo is the core of what we call the mooring line modem or the inductive modem. And it's made up of two parts. It's made up of a head end modem and a subsurface modem. The subsurface modem is on, on your profiler. Uh, the head end modem is inside the Cervelo. You can take that out of the Cervelo and we'll sell that mooring line modem independently of all this data hosting stuff as well. Um, so that head end board is, uh, um, you know, give it 12 volts. It's got 12 volts and a serial port and a uh, coil coupling or a transformer coupling for the ferrite that you're gonna to attach to the top line. And then the subsurface modem is similar. It's got the ferrite coupler that you're familiar with from being inside the wire walker where it just, it's just a clamshell uh, snaps around the line, no tools required. Um, but instead of being attached to our CTD, it's got a small Delrin tube and out of that Delrin tube is an MCBH and you can give it 12 volts and another serial line. And so from the head end modem, which is the master in a kind of master slave topology, it's all very simple uh, kind of English mnemonic commands. So uh, you can, for instance, say things like, I would like to uh, establish a connection with the serial number uh, 12345. And so it's X for connection. It's, I told you it's slightly mnemonic, uh, X12345. And just like the AT command set on Hayes modems in the 1980s, it will come back after a minute and say channel connected. At that point, the head end modem or you on your terminal through the head end modem is talking to the uh, remote instrument, the, sorry, the remote modem. And so you can do things like ask the remote modem um, what board rate are you configured to use for your serial port? Oh, you're at 1200, uh, I need you to be at 9600 and reconfigure the subsurface modem from the top end. Uh, you can also do things like ask the subsurface modem, what's your battery level? Uh, BB, battery value, I guess it is. Um, but the most important thing that you do is usually say, get out of my way. I wanna speak to my instrument that speaks um, goldenish that I've designed down there. And so TP for transparent, and the modem, like a, an operator on a group phone line, gets out of the way 
And now every byte that you send at the top appears out that serial port at the bottom. And every byte that the instrument sends back appears out of the serial port at the top. Uh, there is, just like the AT command set, where we used to go plus, plus, plus a few times with a guard space in between to get the modem's attention, uh, we have the same kind of concept of a guard sequence. And so you issue that guard sequence. The, the guard sequence is configurable because you don't want that guard sequence to ever occur in your normal data stream. So if you're transferring binary data, we don't want to accidentally kick the modem into uh, not being in transparent mode, but you get its attention and then you say, okay, hang up. Now the question uh, arises as to how did I know the serial number of the instrument I wanted to talk to? And usually you have some hapless PhD student who's sitting there uh, making careful notes of the serial numbers of the modems as they go in the water. Or worse yet, in some modem systems, you actually have to configure them on a per deployment basis. What we do instead is we use the serial numbers which are unique across the RBI universe. So there's only one ever, uh, and that includes every instrument we've ever made. But you still have the problem that if they're in the water, you can't see what they are. So from the head-end modem, you can issue the command discover, and the head-end modem will then do a broadcast out to everybody on the line, and it will say, is anybody there? And it will listen. And uh, the subsurface modems will all pick a random time slot, and they'll try to answer. Uh, it's a simplex line. So if multiple ones try to answer at once, they'll collide, and the data will be garbage. But because there's a randomized time slot, and there's about 20 slots that they're allowed to pick from, some of them will come through in the clear, and some of them will collide. I'm assuming that you've got many instruments on the line. When we do that, the head-end modem takes a, a record of which subsurface modems it heard from successfully. Then it tells them to shut up and not do anything else. And it issues the broadcast again and says, hey, everybody else, tell me your number again. And this time, they reseed their random slot with a different number and they come back. And so if you do that a couple of times, pretty soon you get no collisions. And if you get no answers at all, apart from the people that you've told to be quiet, uh, then you know you've got to the end of your enumeration. So we'll do that kind of auto discovery process as well, if you've got more than one instrument, or if you've got a, a diver who's switching out an instrument uh, and you just want to be tolerant to whatever the new instrument is on the line. So that kind of protocol is very simple to make the call, configure the ports if you need to, and you hadn't done that in advance, uh, go transparent, get out of the transparent mode and hang up and do something else. The other one thing I should say, the other thing that the head end modem can do is it can broadcast to all nodes at once with the same command. So let's say you've built some uh, clever widget that responds to the command uh, clock to set their time, or maybe a sample, and uh, a sample is their, their uh, their command to make a spot measurement. And so you can tell the head-end modem, the command you're gonna send is called sample. And here's how you write it, and you use a carriage return at the end. And, the head, and then you can say, I'd like you to poll everybody now. The head-end modem will broadcast the, the command sample to all of your instruments, which understand what that means. And each of the subsurface modems will hear the response coming back, but they won't reply up the inductive chain. They'll just sit there quietly with it. Then the head-end modem automatically round robins to each instrument that's on the line and says, mm, I think you just heard something. What did you hear? And so you're sampling through the water column uh, at a single instant in time, even though you have a delayed return of that data back to the surface. So if you're doing multiple instruments and they all respond to the same command, that can be a useful kind of paradigm as well. Is that helpful? Oh, it's very helpful. Thanks for that. And um, you, you would just uh, be able to intersperse those types of protocols. And if you know if we're designing our own, we could we could have it play nicely with that protocol. Yeah, um, that's right. Uh, but you can, if you don't want to do that, then you can do what the Cervillo does, which is it doesn't use this head end modem polling at all. It just does its own thing, and it just says, "Hey, uh, who do we have on the line? Oh, A, B, and F." Okay, A, I'd like you to do this. Great, I'm done with you. B, I'd like you to do, oh, okay, you got some, great, good, good. Okay, done, F, off we go, that kind of thing. Well, great, thanks. Any other questions from the group? 
All right. Well, I want to thank Greg for that wonderful presentation. And I, I, uh, I really like the, the whiteboard uh, activities. I think that was very helpful and, and the detail that you provided on, on your new products. My pleasure. And uh, thanks very much for having us. And uh, one of these days, we'll be out there again. All right. Well, thank you all for, for attending. And uh, if you got some ideas for future presentations, just shoot them our way. <laughs>